This is the Wealthy Retailer Podcast with your host, Dan Holman. Every episode, Dan talks with a variety of retail experts, owners, managers, and so much more, sharing their expertise, their experiences, and the retail topics that matter to you, the independent retailer. The Wealthy Retailer Podcast is brought to you by Canadian Retail Solutions. Learn more at retailbycrs.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Wealthy Retailer Podcast. I am your host, Dan Holman. Glad to have you back joining us again. Uh, Today, my guests, both guests, um, are they've been booked on the podcast for probably about two months. That's how popular these cats are. Um, And I've been looking forward to this conversation. John and Mark Cronin are father and son team that created John's Crazy Socks. You retailers probably have heard of John's Crazy Socks. Well, this is a social enterprise with a mission to spread happiness. They've bootstrapped their business into the world's largest sock store. John is not only the business owner or a business owner, but he also has Down syndrome. And every day, John and Mark show people what others with differing abilities can do. More than half of their colleagues have a differing ability. And they show their gratitude through their giving back program that's raised nearly a half a million dollars for their charitable partners. Most of all, they're spreading happiness one pair of socks at a time. John and Mark, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. So glad to have you here. Thank you very much. I, I will pleasure to be here. Dan, thank you. That's a great warm introduction. <laughs> Sounded great. We got a lot to live up to now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to say this, guys. Um, you know, as I as I do research and I and I look for these guests that just have the ability to move the needle. Uh, for listeners, it, it didn't take me but about three minutes to say, oh my gosh, I have to have these guys on the mission and I'll, on, the, on the podcast. And I'll tell you what really drew me to this conversation was your five pillars, inspiration and hope, giving back, socks you love, making it personal, and then making it a great place to work. Tell me how you came up with these pillars to build a business on. Well, it started right you know, when we started right in the beginning, there were just certain values when it was just the two of us yeah. that were important. All along, we knew what our mission was. What's our mission? And spreading happiness. Just spreading happiness. Yeah. And it's really a business built on love, not just, you know, which may sound corny or trite, but not just the love between John and I, but just the love of the whole opportunity. So right from the beginning, we had already pledged 5% of our earnings to the Special Olympics. We knew, and right from the very first package we delivered, that we just wanted to wow our customers. You know, that was it. So we evolved those pillars to articulate them. Probably over the first six to nine months, we've added the fifth one. Because when we first started, well, it's just the two of us. Yeah. But now that we have a number of colleagues, you know, you have to add them. And um, I think what's really important is you have to know, you got to know what your purpose is and you got to know what you're all about. So we call them our pillars. You can call them your values. Mm-hmm. You have to know what matters for you because that's going to steer you and shape you. And when things go awry, when things go wrong, you know, when you get a pandemic, yes. you've, got to have, you've got to have that grounding so you can see your North Star and your values will keep you on track. Yeah, really good. And and someone, um, I, I learned a long time ago the importance of values or a belief system. And you're right, that true North is really, you know, why you're doing this. It is the the pillars, the foundation that you build business on. And it makes the difficult things a little bit easier when you can take a step back and say, you know, this was hard today, but look at what we're fulfilling. Well, it also helps you make your decisions and can mm-hmm. point a way forward. But to do that, you actually have to believe in them. I mean, you may have had the unfortunate experience of doing a, you know, a mission statement retreat. Yes. You go off and you parse the words and you come back with a statement that's gobbly look that no human would say, and you put it on a wall and no one pays attention to. Um, for us, we talk all the time. What does it mean to spread happiness? How do we do that? Um, it, 
it becomes manifest in everything we do. And there's a way you can tell. Mm. If you're willing to sacrifice short-term gain to stick with your values, you know you're in the right, you're going in the right direction. Yeah, I got I've, I've got the biggest smile on my face because this is so connecting to us. In our companies, we we live by our core values, one of them being service above self. We we believe that we live in consequence to the success of others. I own a, a technology company, a point of sale company, and we often remind ourselves that we're in this for the long haul, not the short term. You know, and service above self means someone else has to be successful before we're ever going to feel success. And I love this idea of spreading happiness. Happiness is our fifth core value, that everyone around us has to be happy. They've got to find that level of, of contentment and success and, and joy that comes with accomplishing what they accomplish every day. And you've got to find uh, uh, happiness in every single thing you're doing. Otherwise, it's not worth doing. There's, you know, there's the line in the founding document in the U.S. talking about the pursuit of happiness. Right. You know, it's been suggested that perhaps that should be the pursuit of meaning because, in fact, we get happiness from the pursuit of meaning. Right. And, John, what do you say are the two keys to happiness all the time? It's, it's gratitude and do for others. Gratitude and do for others. Yeah. Um, so we share that, right? Yeah. The more we can do for others, the better off we are. And that will sustain you over the long haul. Right? Uh, uh, here, here's an example I will use. Uh, email list. You and your listeners know. Yeah. A business's email list is one of their mo- is one of the most valuable assets you have. So, and here's the reality: I'm sure your listeners know. Every time we send out an email, we get a little uptick in sales. Yeah. Okay? So, boy, there is a temptation to send out emails all the time. And I know businesses that we get them from. I get two or three a day from right. some. <laughs> But you don't want that. You want to be inundated. And because what we're looking for is to create a connection with our customers, to have a relationship and to share experiences. We only do two emails a week. One of them is John's Friday email. No sales. It's just an update on what John is doing. It's just an update on what's going on. And it's mm. personal and sharing, right? So last week, it was Mother's Day in the U.S. Mm-hmm. You wrote about your mother. I did. This upcoming week, you know, it's, it's something sad. Or his uncle, my brother-in-law, was a New York City firefighter who passed mm-hmm. away suddenly um, related to the work he did on what's known as the 9-11 pile after right. Right? So John's going to share that in his email. Well, that's not selling socks. Right. It's creating that connection. And that's why we have a 43% open rate on our emails. Right. Do, right. Mm-hmm. You, you have, you're in it for the long haul. You're in it for that relationship. Not, oh, if I send this today, I'm going to get a little bit more in sales. Right. How do you... How do you um, measure that success of the relationship? Is it the open rate? Is it the connectivity? Or is it the traditional retail scorecard? We move the needle north in sales. We do it. There is no one number for us. I know, you know, I've listened to folks. You got to have one number. So we're always taking a bigger picture. Absolutely, we follow, you know, the big three numbers for e-commerce, yeah. traffic, conversion rate, AOV. Absolutely, we track that. And, and, and obviously orders and, and revenue. But we're also tracking what's the reorder rate. Right? Yeah. We, we do, uh, we're always asking for feedback from our customers in numbers of different ways of surveys we take. So we track our net promoter score. You you familiar with that? Yes, for sure. Yeah. We have an NPS of 92 
Um, wow. Which is off the charts. It's so high to be like unreal. Yeah. Right. Um, but we verified that number of ways. But you can't just take the NPS because, well, really, what does that tell you? Yeah. So we have other survey questions and we track that. We track our reviews. Um, so you, you're, you're tracking that. But we also look, what's our engagement like with our customers on social media? And some of that is what's happening with that email list and the engagement. Um, and, you know, it, the email is pretty simple. Right. We only send emails to people who want to get them. Part. So we keep peeling off the email list. If you don't want to get the email from us, we're not going to keep sending it. We don't want to bother you. Right. Um, so, you know, and so now our list, oh, that Friday email goes to about 85,000 people. We can send it to a lot more. But why, why do you want to bother? Right. Uh, we also track our um, giving back. Where are we with that rate? And what's happening with employment? And what percentage of our colleagues have a different ability? Mm -hmm. So as a social enterprise, you've got multiple factors you have to look at. There's no one thing. There's no one number. Yeah. Does and so, sense? yeah, absolutely. When did you, when did you and John start this? When did this idea come to fruition? Um, I, I, I this my idea. And I, I started, I, I started when I, 20, 20 years old. What day did we open? Oh, okay. Um, we opened on the Friday, the 9th, 2016. And it was John's idea. Yes. Right. Um, John, you were in your last year of school. Yeah, I'm trying to be in my last year. Trying to figure out what do I do next? Yeah. What were you looking at? I like a job program in school. I don't like that. I don't like. And Dan, that's an unfortunate reality for too many people with right. disability. In the U.S., only one in five people with a disability are employed. Um, there just aren't enough opportunities out there. Right. And then you run into prejudices and hmm. obstacles. But John here, he's a natural entrepreneur. You didn't see a job you wanted. What were you going to do? I want to create one. I want to make one. What did you tell me? I told my dad. I want, I want, I want to go business, business with you. A nice father and son business together. Right now, I'm a lucky man. Yes, you are. I, I've got three <laughs> sons. John's the youngest, and this is one I can work with. So, you know, <laughs> um, and then it was, what are we going to do? You work with entrepreneurs. You know, entrepreneurs yeah. have a lot of ideas, <laughs> some of which are good ideas, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what was one of your ideas? One of them is a food truck. I have an idea from the movie Chef and John Farrow. Yes. Yeah, the movie about a father and son bonding a food truck. So we're thinking, okay, what could we make? Where would we put it? This seemed like a lot of fun, uh, but we, we did run into a problem. We can't cook. Yeah, we can't cook. But then, you know, whose idea was it to sell socks? Uh, this is my idea. I want uh, uh, a fun, a colorful experience. It will always let me be me. Yep. Yeah. Um, we used to drive around looking for these socks for John. Right. So we figured this. If he loved them that much, surely other people would too, and we could find our tribe. Right. And and here's the thing. Now, you may have, you know, leather-skinned uh, uh, retailers listening to you who've been through it all. Um, when you go to start something, the traditional way is do that business plan. You know, plan everything through, think it all through. Uh, that's not what we did. We went the lean startup route. We said, let's get something up and test the idea. And customers will let us know. So we bootstrapped it. You already had the name. I got a name. I got a website. I got an idea. We built our store on a good Canadian company platform, on the <laughs> Shopify platform. On Shopify, yeah. Um, we got a little bit of inventory. We were bootstrapping. So you have to make do with what you have. 
Yeah. So the only real marketing we did was to set up a Facebook page and I would take out my cell phone and we made videos. And who was in those videos? I am. I talk about socks. Socks, socks, bought socks. We noticed something though. Those videos started spreading. And then we opened, as he said, on Friday, December 9th, 2016. Not surprisingly, most of the orders were local orders. Mm. We lived, we live on Long Island outside New York City, yeah. a town called Huntington. He's at the high school. That's where we lived. So, um, but that first day we got what felt like a flood of orders. We got 42 orders. Right? It was the middle of the holiday season. Most of them local. So what we do with those first deliveries? Our home delivery, we give red box electrics one. We put the socks in the box and we looked at it and said, this needs something else. So what are we going to do? What else we put in? I put in a thank you note I wrote and candy. Handwritten thank you note from John. And we got bags of Hershey's Kisses and poured them in, loaded up the car, drove around, you knocking on doors, handing out socks. I did. How the customers respond? Customers loved it. They take a picture, share it on social media. Would I get that spread? We had customers ordering again just to get John to come back to their door. And and you can imagine this, right? It's just the two of us getting all this done. So there are nights, it's after 10 o'clock at night, and John's knocking on doors saying, just drop with your socks. Don't shoot. You know? <laughs> <That's what I mean. laughs> um, but we were able to test the idea. And at the end right. of that month, really two weeks, we had 452 orders. We had 13000 in revenue. And we said, okay, we can do something here. You know, one. One, people want to buy socks. Two, people want to buy socks for me. They related to John. Right. They, they liked the personal touch. They liked the giving back to the Special Olympics. And I had no background in retail. So you learn by doing, right? And we learned that this young man. This is old man. This old man. We could sell socks. They're old. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but... You, you could see ingredients in there. Even if we had not articulated those pillars to start, we knew what we believed. Right. We knew what we're going to be about. You, and there's an aesthetic we have, which, which still runs true. Our approach is ready, fire, aim. Mm. Don't overthink. Just take action. Go, go and do. And then keep learning. Right. Right. Um, I mean, I give you an example of that. Um, socks, this is not going to shock you, even in the great white north, are very seasonal. Nobody buys socks in the summer, but they buy them lots in the holiday season. Right. Well, we got to learn this. Right? We didn't know this going in. Other smarter people could have told us, but. So now it's the first, we're approaching our first summer and nobody's buying anything. And one of the things we decided to do was let's start a subscription to Sock of the Month Club. Pretty basic idea. So we sat around with our colleagues and within a week, we had built the web pages, we had figured out the inventory, the shipping, and we started our Sock of the Month Club. About three months later, one of our suppliers, who's also a competitor, started a Sock of the Month Club. And we got to talking and I asked them about it. And they told me they had been working on that for a year and a half. I was like, what the hell were you doing? <laughs> well, you know, we had the committees, we had to review this and that. I'm like, oh my gosh. Meanwhile, we're three months into it. We got real customers, real revenues, and we're on our third iteration. And they're never going to catch up. Right. Right. Not because we're particularly smart. It's just because you learn from doing, go out and take action. Right. And in retail, John and, and Mark, this, this idea of ready, fire, aim, I, in retail, we figure things out. Those that are left at the, at the prep line stretching, you know, aren't going to win the race. You've got to get it out there and test it and try it and, and let evolution win. Learn from every misstep along the way. There's got to be missteps. Yes. Or, uh, you know. I, 
everything we do is a hypothesis. Right. We think it's going to work. And I'm not, when I say ready, aim, fire, I'm not suggesting willy nilly. You got to be thoughtful, but don't overdo it. Right. It's, take the action and then measure and see what happens. I, I mean, I'll share one that, you know, all e commerce stores grapple with free shipping. How do you handle free shipping? At what level do you handle free shipping? So for several years now, our free shipping has been at $50. Right. Well, our average order value is now pretty snug up against that $50. Um, And our net shipping costs have been climbing. Mm -hmm. So we said, all right, what, what do we do about this? And it's kind of scary, right? Because there's no easy answer. We've now raised our free shipping level to $60 US. Um, Here's our hypothesis. We think by nudging it up, it will encourage people perhaps by a little bit more. So our AOV will go up. Right. It will reduce our net shipping cost, but we recognize it'll probably hurt conversion conversion rates. Okay. Now, what do we do? Well, we, we've taken a stamp at it. Now let's go measure and see what happens. Let's right. hope we're right, but maybe we're going to be wrong. Right. I, I, but you could study this to the cows come home. And until you try it, you don't know. That's right. Right. And I think good, good retail, I mean, I, I, you know, a guy that spends a bit of time in retail coaching would have said, if your AOV is, you know, 49 bucks, free shipping needs to be at 49 bucks and then let's get it to 55 and then 60 and then 65 to increase the average order value with at, with some level of, I don't want to call it a carrot, but an incentive to add that one more pair. Right. To get over that free shipping. It is what we see as the, the biggest hurdle once we've added to cart. It's, oh, I got to pay for shipping. Well, um, yeah. in today's world, shipping is a real thing. You know, with the price of fuel and you know the competition for shipping, it's 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 a true expense that we have to manage. And getting your AOV to a place where you can manage shipping expenses, you know, at four to six percent, maybe makes a little more sense than you know breaking even. Check back with us in a couple of months. (laughs) All right, all right. So we started that first that first iteration with thirteen thousand bucks in sales and. Correct me if I'm wrong, six years ago almost. Yeah, well, five just over half. five months, right? Five, yeah, just over five, five years. years, I'm sorry. Yeah. So where are we today? Where, you know, take the endpoint. So here's one measurement. How many different socks do we have now? We have 4,000 different socks. 4,000, which makes John here the owner of the world's largest sock store. Yeah. We've shipped 380,000 orders to 88 different countries. Um, our revenue has been up and down. Uh, we'll be around 3 million probably this year, yeah. um, but we're climbing, you know, we had, we had spiked up, crashed down, yep. survived the pandemic. Last year we grew 47%. Um, and you know, we have, we have, we think solid plans for the future. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it enables us to carry out our mission to reach more people to spread the message, to hire more people. Yeah. And you still have to have those core values. So we're always looking, how can we make a personal connection? How can we share experiences? To this day, if we get an order between our warehouse and our home, what are you doing with it? I'm still doing home deliveries. Still doing home deliveries. Home deliveries. Yeah, that's um, great. That's admirable. You know, it's um, we still have no... If you call here, a, an actual person answers the phone. We have no scripts. We yeah. don't time people. It's going to be a human conversation. And we have people who love those conversations on the phones. Yeah. So 4,000, how do you plan your inventory? How do you manage inventory? There are... Um, a lot of that will become dead inventory. Yeah. In the sense of in the sense of we're not going to carry it anymore. You know, you 
if it's not selling, we're going to drop it. We're going to bring something else in. Right. Um, but socks are not like perishables, so they don't go bad. Um, we watch industry trends. We watch what's happening with our customers. I mean, one of the things we learned fairly early on from our suppliers, our customers had different buying patterns than all of the other people that bought from them. Um, you know, we know from surveys, over 80% of our customers have never bought socks online before. Right? So it's not something that they're used to doing. Um, we, but we now have somebody who it's her job, manage our uh, product development and manage our inventory. Mm -hmm. I'm smart enough to know I'll make suggestions on things, but Kristen will make decisions in the end. Right. Um, you know, I once suggested we carry kites. Oh, God, we didn't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you have added some ancillary products, right? Some complementary yeah, products. We have gradually, though our focus, you know, here's another thing of, we have a lot of ideas. So certainly for our strategic planning this year, the overall theme for the planning part was do less to do more. Don't try to do everything. So our overall strategy is drive the mission. The more we drive the mission, the more connections we make and the more we differentiate ourselves. So drive the mission, that drives the brand. Then we want to be everywhere our customers are. So we started by selling direct to consumer. Now we're growing our B2B business. Mm -hmm. So someone like yourself, uh, you got a coaching business. Maybe you buy custom socks with your logos on it to give out to customers. Or you know, Google and Microsoft have bought thousands to give out at conferences. Right. And we're entering the wholesale channel. Yeah. So um, that our plan is to be in the wholesale channel by the fourth quarter. We're already selling on Zappos. We'll be selling through Macy's.com. We're going to be in 856 Kohl's stores by the fourth quarter in the fourth quarter. And that's going to enable us to sell to your audience of right. the mom and pop shops, the individual stores. Yep. But to do that, we needed to grow more of our own because we started only by reselling other people's socks mm -hmm. to be able to design and manufacture our own. Um, and so then we'll continue to do that, um, growing out that line, adding a line of athletic socks. We're talking to a major pod podiatry practice. That's a regional podiatry practice about working with them to have doctor, you know, doctors. Compression sock, yeah. Compression and, and diabetic socks. Um, yeah. We, but, and some of that is, we have very loyal customers who are very happy, but there may only be so many socks you can buy. So what else can we offer? You don't right. want to just offer junk. Um, so we'll test, we'll, we've started adding some other items. We have blankets now, we have some kitchen goods. Uh, we've had shirts, t-shirts and yeah. things, logo yeah. shirts, and creating more content, right? Mm. Uh, we now have the Spreading Happiness podcast. Yes, yeah, we really do. What do you do every Tuesday afternoon? Dan I, I, I hold a dance party every Tuesday at 3 p.m. John hosts an online dance party. What better way to spread happiness? Yeah. Right? Um, so there's lots of opportunities. Yeah. As John would tell you, we're just getting started. Um, and... A major initiative we have this year, and this is my favorite, we're creating a program called JCS Champions. And the idea is we're going to put people with a differing ability into their own business by giving them a business in a box. They'll be able to open micro retail stores. They'll go to farmers markets, craft mm -hmm. fairs. We'll give them a selling stand and inventory and marketing materials so they can go, not a franchise, we're not owning the business, they can go and have their own business. If they want to sell other products, they can go and do that. So we're going to enroll five people 
by the end, by, by October, we want to get started with five. But our plan is over five years to enroll 1,000 people in that program. Um, we want to show entrepreneurism as an option and show what people with different abilities can do. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, yeah. That is, I'm speechless. That is so, so incredibly I, I I I don't I don't know what the words are to describe how fabulous that is, Mark John. That is to give people the opportunity that they would not otherwise have had is probably one of the most admirable things that you can do as a as a I don't want to say a spinoff, but as a result of the work that you're putting into your business today is really admirable. And it is part of our social enterprise. Mm-hmm. Right? They will become ambassadors for our business, of course. It'll become an outlet for our business. Um, so, you know, that's part of it. We want to show that all, you know, I, I think this is where businesses are moving, right? It's right. Sharing all your stakeholders, not just shareholders, but in the long run, mm-hmm. that's more sustainable. Yeah. And, and part of it, as you mentioned in conversation before we started, you know, you're looking to inspire people. Right. And you're doing that, right? We, we got asked a question once by a high school student at a talk we were given. Who did you need to ask permission from to do this? It seems like a throwaway or a silly question, but it's really quite profound. Because at the end of the day, what usually holds us back? It's between our ears. Right. So if we can show people, yes, this is possible. You know, it's, we're always advocating that, that it's good business to hire people with different abilities, that it's not altruism. Right? Well, the best thing we can do is show that. And as more people see that and do it, then it'll gain momentum. Right. I, how many of your employees today, of your coworkers or your colleagues today are of differing abilities? 22 out of 34. 22 out of 34. Right. Wow. And, and what I want to be really clear about this. If you got to know us, mm-hmm. you would find out that John here is a very nice guy. I am not. Everybody who works for us yeah. has earned that job. And that's part of the dignity. Everybody produces. Right. And if you if you come back to our fifth pillar of mm-hmm. make this a great place to work. So we've got five pieces to that too. One, offer people a mission worthy of their commitment. Something bigger than ourselves, something that matters, something that's serving other people and in doing that will make you feel good. It's gotta be something other than we're gonna go make money. And and don't get me wrong. Right. We wanna make money. John and I like to live indoors. Um, but you got to offer that. But then the second, make sure everybody knows why his or her job matters. Everybody's got to know how their job is connected to that mission and why it makes a difference. There's no make work job. There's no cog in the machinery. So if you go talk to our sock wranglers, that's what we call the pick. We do our own fulfillment. Picking, yeah. Pick and pack warehouse. You go talk to our sock wranglers, to a person, ask them, put some mission, spreading happiness. Why is your job important? Because I have to get the right socks to the right people. They know. Third, put people in a position to succeed. Don't ask people to do what they can't do. We don't ask John to do our finances. We don't ask me to do our graphic arts work. Right. If, if our webmaster needs a particular software tool, get him the tool. If somebody, one of our packers needs a special chair, get the chair. Now, it's not that we have endless resources. Right. But put people in a position to succeed. And then four recognize what people do. Look at you, Dan. You care about this podcast. You put this time into the podcast. You're thoughtful about it. Doesn't it make you feel good when somebody says, hey, Dan, I was listening. That was great. Yeah. Right? Mm. 
as an employer, it could be as simple as going around and say, thank you. Thank you. You helped us do this. And then the last piece, stay the hell out of the way. Let people do their jobs. Right? And if you do all that, you're going to have you're going to have happy, dedicated, caring people. Right. And, and as a leader, I mean, you mentioned this earlier in the conversation, right? Part of our job is to set the direction and the tone. You know, set, help set the strategy. But we're also at the bottom of the org chart. Our job is to serve everybody else to make sure they're able to do their job. Right. Right. None of this is the proverbial rocket science. It doesn't take a genius. The two of us, we're just a couple of knuckleheads selling socks. Right. So we do want to change the world. <laughs> exactly. I, I believe that those of us that have a desire to change the world, um, you know, find ways that us knuckleheads can be successful. You know, we have a different we have a different outcome than others have. I always feel like people are people are motivated by one of three things. You know, get rich, be famous, or make change. And you know, sometimes famous and change are connected together. I feel like I'm in the company of you know, you might think you're knuckleheads, but I feel like I'm in the company of two famous guys that if they're in a room, you're the ones I'm going to go and listen to. You know, and I, I feel like that that's that is empowering. And no matter what business you're in, if you can think about it the way you do, success will not elude you. Your success will not elude you. Others spend so much time in the in the book of you know in the entrepreneurial books. This this is not written up in a book anywhere. No, no, and and that's part of it. You have to know what you're about. Right. You got to know. You got to know what matters, and that's that's what's sustainable, right? It's that thing. If if we send three emails a day to everybody, our revenue will pop up. Right. It's not going to be sustainable. It's not sustainable. It no longer matters. No, and you know one of the things. One of the things that we think is powerful, um, entrepreneurs can have a huge impact in this world. Hmm. Entrepreneurs have driven so much change. I, I'm not saying all entrepreneurs are perfect and we all are, no. you know, challenged by things we do. You know, Elon Musk, boy, he seems off his rocker sometimes, but employees move the car market, you know, the whole exchange forward, right? He's moved yeah. the whole battery industry forward. I don't know what the hell he's going to do with Twitter, but, um, yeah. but no. we can do that. And we get to create the world in which we want to live. Right. I, I mean, I'll give you a, an anecdote on that. You know, not long ago, um, a customer had called up to place an order on the phone. Now understand, we don't take orders over the phone. We only take them online. Unless you call and want to give us an order on the phone, we're going to help you. Right. And this particular customer didn't like credit cards either. You know, all this technology. Wanted to send us a check. Well, we made a mistake. We waited for her check to arrive before we pulled the order. Yeah. In the intervening time, the one of the items she ordered sold out. So I'm hearing this. And, you know, I happened over here and said, well, how come we didn't just send the order right away? Well, we had to wait till we got the check. So why? I mean, Dan, if you told me you were going to send me a check, would you send me a check? Yeah. And this wasn't a random faceless person. This was somebody we had a conversation with. Right. And wouldn't we rather live in that world? Yes. Wouldn't, Wouldn't we, we rather live in the world where we could go? And when you told me you're going to do something, I trusted you. And right. I demonstrated that faith in you. Um, and we had more conversations. Somebody said, well, okay, but if it's a really big order, if it's over $100, we can't do it. Why? 
And and somebody else said, can we do this? We can do anything we want. Right. And I went back and looked. Over five years, nobody's ever bounced a check. Right. right. So let's live in that world. We can make that world. You know, uh, we were at a week ago, was it? Uh, we went to uh, an indoor water park uh, uh, I don't know, hotel complex down in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania. When you walked in the room, they had signs up telling you, do not take anything out of the room. And if you did, they had a price list. We're going to charge you this and this and this. I'm looking at this thinking, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? That's what you're greeting us with? Yeah. And, and that's probably because somebody looked at a spreadsheet and said, oh, somebody's stealing towels. We better cut that. It's costing us this much money. But look at the world you're creating. Right. Who right. Wins? A world oh. of mistrust. Yeah, exactly. You know, guys, I, I I believe that there are really only two people in our in our world that that have the ability to move the needle. One of them's entrepreneurs, the other's educators. You know, we're the only ones that are in it for the long haul. When have you met, you know, an educator that hasn't been in it or that isn't in it for their life or an entrepreneur that isn't in it for their life? It's unlike politics or, you know, it's not short term. We're here to make change. And we're the only ones that are prepared to, to go the extra mile. You know, and every one of these missteps, like that hotel, like perhaps not fulfilling that order ahead of the check arriving, forgets about the value of someone's, you know, their lifetime value to you. Yes. And every single person that they know. And this is part of the inspiration and guidance I take from my partner. Right. Just a sense of gratitude. Yeah. Right. We've been able to do fabulous things. We've had great experiences. Um, well, our customers have made all that possible. Yeah. Right. And so you've got to, you've got to love them. Yeah. Right. You, and treat them that way. And guess what? People then respond. You know, I'm thinking yeah. my middle son, who for a while I, I think he was trying to find the worst possible job in North America. Because every job he had, it was, it was an awful job. And he's working, they called the customer service. It was none, none of the, no such thing. At a nutraceutical company, one of these places where, you know, we'll send you the free capsule of pills that will magically grow your hair or lose your weight or something. But you have to give us your credit card because, you know, the small print says, now we're going to send you one a week and right. charge you $90. So his job was to answer the phone calls when you called up and outraged what you were doing. And his job, his task was to convince you to buy more. Right. When he showed up at the place, you had to, in front of people, empty your pockets and take everything out and put them in a little locker. Couldn't have your phone with you. And then they walked you to your desk and you had to sign in at your desk. And they monitored everything you did. To go to the bathroom, you had to ask permission to get up from your desk. Um, oh, my gosh. Mm. Now, what type of performance? They, they assumed we can't trust you. Right. We don't know. Well, what type of performance, performance do you think they got? Yeah. And yet, if you took those same people and inspired them and encouraged them and supported them, you would get a completely different result. Yes, you would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I give him my answer. Gents, I, I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and would be happy to sit here and listen to you forever. But out of respect for your time, um, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining no, I'm me. I'm sorry, on the we podcast. run off at the mouth sometimes. Never mind. Sorry. No, no, this is perfect. Listeners, uh, you want to find out a little bit more about this dynamic duo, John and his his buddy, uh, Mark, his dad, uh, head over to johnscrazysocks.com. Uh, there's a there's 4,000 choices there for you in socks retailers. If you're looking for uh, spreading a little happiness with some socks, follow up on johnscrazysocks.com as well. Guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, this Dan. This is great. Real pleasure. Retailers, make sure that you are subscribed 
to the Canadian Retail Solutions weekly newsletter, retailbycrs.com. Sign up for that. Get a copy of this podcast with John and his dad, Mark, uh, and a ton of other great information that Alex and the team share over at uh, Canadian Retail Solutions. Until next week, happy retail.